it was difficult to come to terms with the fact that I was never going to be the same again. E even the smallest things are, are a pain when you have a disability. But the thought that I might not get out of that horizontal position, that I might, uh, my wife might become my carer for the rest of my life, that I might become a burden on my wife and my family, um, and that I'd be no use to society. Mm. I'm rubbish now, I'm no good. Let's chuck me out. That, those were all thoughts that, that I had. And in fact, one of, the, um, one of the strongest memories I've got is of in, during the time of the accident, um, when I was laying on the floor, on the floor, just knocked off my bike. And I realized then that something was bad and something was wrong because um, I'm laying on my back and I can, can't, all my leg hurts. And then my neck, oh, I can't move my arm, can't move my arm. Um, and I could smell the green grass and it's, a, it's a, a late September evening. And I knew I was gonna be either very disabled or very dead. And I could see my wife looking over my grave. And um, you know, that's a moment where, very dark for me, and you realize and you think, well, and my thought was, well, you've had a good life, Neil. And you think about those days, I resigned myself to what was going to come. Neil, welcome to Inspirability. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show today. Nice to be here, Harriet. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. So now you are a very keen private pilot. You're also a trustee for Aerobility and you're part of our volunteer team here at Aerobility as well. In addition to that, though, you've also had your own personal challenges to overcome after a catastrophic motorbike accident in 2014, which you're going to discuss with us today. So first of all, Put it into some context for me, though, and tell me a little bit about who is Neil. Oh, who is Neil? Um, Neil's an absolute propeller head, completely loves his planes, and has done since he was about that big. Um, I, was, I was in the Royal Navy for a short period, but I was as good a sailor as, as Uncle Al, but only fools and horses, so I wasn't in the Navy very long. Um, went to university, did a degree, and then came out and went into industry, working with telecoms and broadband. Lived in Kazakhstan, learned Russian, traveled the world on business, um, and life was going quite well until September 2014, when I was knocked off my motorbike in, in Oxfordshire. And what did you want to be when you grew up then? Tell me a little bit about your childhood and so, what I, young Neil was like. Neil always wanted to fly Buccaneers. There was only one plane in the world that was the, the, the Buccaneer, 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 Buccaneer. And that was never going to be a possibility for me, unfortunately. Um, but then as you get older, obviously, your targets might change a little bit. Reality might might settle in. You, you're not. The, you're never going to be the best pilot you thought you were going to be. Um, and job in industry was a wonderful thing for me because it allowed me to work with technology and, and travel across the world and, 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 and learn new skills. So I've always had the travel bug. I think that was putting me from from the time in the Royal Navy. And you know I, I've always loved aviation, but obviously you get other priorities in life. Your family comes first and all this. So I didn't fly for many, many years. In fact, there was a small gap of about 35 years between me getting my PPL and me flying again with, with air ability in 2018, September 2018. So tell me about doing your PPL then when you were younger. What was it like? Oh, it was easy. You know, of course it was easy. I was, I was talking about this this morning. I was saying how having a catastrophic industry like the, in this injury like this um, makes you quite... Not nervous, but considered about every move that you take. When I was 17, I was immortal, you know, soldered in seven and a half hours. Of course I did. You know. And there was that lovely confidence, probably arrogance, actually, that, that went with it, with the immortality that, that lived with you. And I guess as you get older, and certainly when you go through this, you realize how, how mortal you are. But that was, you know, I, I talk about my happy smell. So you know yourself, when you're checking the aircraft over, the first thing you do is you you pop off the, the caps and you, you take a sniff of the fuel tank and you make sure there's 100 ml in there. And you know, every time I smell that, from when I was a 17 year old to where I am now, it's my happy smell. It's, I know what I'm gonna do in about 20 minutes, I'll be in the air, I'll be flying, yeah, it's wonderful. So yeah, it's, uh, that, that love hasn't gone away at all. And so you did your private pilot's license. How about school, what was school like? A school was very good. I went to a private school in South Wales that doesn't exist anymore. It's a, it's a block of flats now, unfortunately. 
um, a little school called Dumbarton House. My father was a steel worker and um, my mother was a, was a homemaker. I had a, a disabled sister who was profoundly disabled from birth. And so I would travel every day over to school in Swansea from, from Port Talbot and uh, did my O-levels as they were then back in 1984, which is when I did my O-levels. And I did my A-levels then in 86 in, uh, in Neath. So I'd had a sort of a, a technical background with the, the exams that I had. I knew that wherever I got to, there'd be something technically involved in, in, in my life. But yeah, I was a typical young Welshman, loved rugby, um, loved the aeroplanes and, and, and enjoyed going to school. And in terms of school, what were your favourite subjects? What did you think you'd be moving into? Oh, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's maths, chemistry, physics, and, and all the sciences. You know, I wanted to be the buccaneer pilot, the fighter pilot. That's the, and, and were it not for the dream that I had, um, it wouldn't have given me the foundations that I, that I had for the life that I had further on. Because of the aspirations I had, I knew I had to study, and I did study. And when that, that aspiration didn't materialise for one reason or another, I still had that foundation then of, of qualifications um, with a degree as well in, in aeronautical engineering that allowed me then as, as a good foundation for my later life, for a job which I loved doing for 20 odd years. So one of the things that we often talk about with guests on Aspirability is that first moment that they failed at something and how you really come down to earth with a bump and picking themselves back up from it. Can you think of when you first failed at something and felt like that? It's gonna sound, I think it's gonna sound quite trite for some people because they don't realize uh, what it meant to me though, but, but yes, I can. And it was, so I had a flying scholarship from the Royal Air Force uh, when I was 17 to get my PPL, okay? And up until this point, so I was 17, I'd, I'd done some of my O-levels early in the fourth form rather than the fifth form. I'd done my O-levels and I got good grades in my O-levels. I was sort of through going, going through my um, uh, A-levels at the time. So everything, tick, 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 tick. And I'd gone to do my RT exam, my radio exam. And because I was so distracted by whatever it was that was, that was causing the distraction, I completely fluffed it, completely blew that, that exam. Now, up until that point, it had all been ticks in the box. And so I, I can remember coming out as a 17-year-old and, and crying because I'd failed that. Now, you know and I know that a little bit more practice and you're back in again, back in the race again. And sure enough, the next week I'd, I'd pass that exam. But that was just the first of, well, I guess there's a bunch of, it. life is, is, is full of failures. But it's, I guess it's like Rudyard Kipling, is how you meet with triumph and disaster and meet those two imposters both the same. Um, but it's it set you up for life to realize that, hey, stuff like this does happen. And how do you cope with it? Well, I'm a lifelong committed person to optimism. You know, I, I'm always looking on the bright side of things. So for my, my coping strategy, which was at that time, and it's the same now, is the sun will come out tomorrow. It's going to be better tomorrow. Um, and something is going to improve. Something's going to change around and put me in a good situation. And you know what? Invariably it does. So it's that optimism that, that has always carried me through, through my life even when I was laying in the hospital, dying, frankly. And did that first experience of failure, did that change that enthusiastic, immortal 17-year-old, Neil? No, I don't think it did. I mean, I, I, I guess, I, I, but it was, a, it was a salutary lesson to myself that, hey, you keep your eye on the ball and you'll only get out what you put into life. There's nothing handed to you on a plate. And even when, you know, the trials and tribulations of life hit you, you know, that feeling sorry for yourself, just doesn't cut the mustard you've got to pick yourself up and, and, and get on otherwise you're, you're just sitting in a chair feeling sorry for yourself for the rest of your life so for any of our viewers and listeners who have experienced a situation like that maybe it's the first time they failed at something or it's something that they've really put their heart and soul into and it's just not worked out for whatever reason and they're really struggling to find that motivation to pick themselves up move on what advice would you give them I'd honestly say to people that, that it will get better. It will. Just put your mind to that. Just don't sit feeling sorry for yourself. I could share a, an, an even probably a more important moment where I considered myself to be a complete failure. And that was when I had my accident. So I'd had my accident and as part of it, I lost my company. I laid off 15 people with other jobs. 
Um, I'd been promising my wife that this company was going to pay off and do well. And it was, it was climbing, it was going well. But there was a point where I almost lost everything, you know, as a part of that accident. And I felt a part of that failure for that company. The truth of the matter was I was, I was taken off my motorbike by somebody else. I was, the situation was out of my control, but I nevertheless still felt a failure. And being in that room after coming out of hospital on your own, thinking, well, this is what my life, was this what my life has come to? It's, it's a scary place to be, especially for someone who's as, as confident as, as I am. Um, but, and it's through the support of a good organization such as Airability, I was able to get my old mojo back again and realize that there are, there's always an option. There's always an answer. There's always another way out. Um, and it's just for you to find that way. I can't, I can't tell you what your pressure would be, what, what, what would make you um, get up and get on again. But there is always something out there that would, that would capture your, your spirit and, and pull you out of your spiral dive. So one of our, well, our strapline here at Inspirability is you have control. And I think what you've just said about, you know, you were in a room, a situation you couldn't control what happened to the company. But what you can do is somehow control how you respond and what skills and tools you equip yourself with. So what do you think, what advice can you give to someone in that sort of situation of how they can regain that control or control their response to try and work through a challenge like that? And there's, I think the challenges can be broken down into, into two, two areas. Really. There's a physical and there's a mental challenge. But paradoxically, I think that if I could sit down with 18-year-old Neil here now and speak to him and, or pull a little SD card out of my mind and, and put it into his head, uh, I'd say that you are capable of doing whatever you put your mind to. And again, it, it sounds quite, yeah, well, sure, really? No, no, you know what? That sounds quite easy to do that. But you are a product of what your mind puts forward. If it, I was there in a hospital, broken, bloody, and, and in, in a wrecked state, um, and I determined I was going to fly again. Simple as that. Um, I was laughed at, I was ridiculed, and a lot of clinicians said to me, quite, with some quite justification, saying, you know what, Neil, there's a chance you might not even stand up again, let alone fly an aeroplane uh, again. Um, but I had a plan. I had a plan. Um, I had to get fitter. I knew that. I had to be healthy, safe, before I'd even, even think about stepping into an aeroplane. So to get there, it's all about, I think, it's the positive mindset. And my wife would probably call me bloody-minded. It's probably quite true. But that single-mindedness combined with the optimism has, has helped me a lot. And so it's, it's about persistence. It's about determination. If you really want to do something, you can absolutely do it, whatever, whatever that is. So, Neil, you mentioned your sister was profoundly disabled from birth. Yep. Has that shaped your understanding of disability even before your accident and then after your accident? I think my dear sister Bear, my late dear sister, unfortunately she passed away in 2016, um, had a, a more profound effect on my life than I, than I ever knew. Um, God bless Bear. Um, she was born with a, a, a disability called microcephaly, and all her life she, she couldn't walk. She, she could talk, she could say beer, she could, she knew one bad word which she would call me as an insult, which was always much, much amusement to the family. It was the only word that she could say was, was a profane one. Um, but she was used as an example uh, by my mum who would always say to us, oh, Bev would give her a left arm to be doing what you're doing, or she'd give anything. Of course, it was like a motivation for us kids. I mean, it was all, yeah, Bev this, Bev that. But it was obviously had a profound effect on me because I am left with what I say. I call it the, the attitude of gratitude. Uh, I'm so glad that I'm here, even as I am now in, in bits and pieces. I am eternally grateful for the fact that, you know, although I've got a disability, um, I'm in a better position than, than a lot of people I know. And sort of Bev gave me that, um, the impetus, but also the understanding of living with people with disabilities for the good and the bad. And in fact, when I was in university, there was a choice of going and working in McDonald's and earning whatever, or going and working in a home for people with a disability, or as it was in 30, 30 odd years ago, it was a home for the handicapped, as we would, it was called at that time. Um, it paid a lot more. <laughs> 
And for me, it was just brilliant because I'd been around people with disabilities all my life. And then some of my best memories came from working at that, that place in the summer. So my sister Bev and working at a little place called Candy House um, was a, a great preparation for me. And I'm sure that my wife would say that one of my few good, good things is I'm quite tolerant and quite patient. Um, and I think that tolerance and patience comes from living and working with people with a disability from a very, very young age and more accepting and more understanding of disabilities. I guess it also makes me um, a little bit strong as well in the sense that I don't like it when people use their disability as a lever to try and get something, turn something to their own benefit, which I think is a purely human trait, uh, but doesn't mean necessarily I, I have to like that. But yeah, Bev had a strong foundation um, in, in, in my future which is why aerobility for me was just ticking all the boxes. Aeroplanes, yep, disability, yep. Yeah, it's just, just worked so, so beautifully. So in terms though of, um, so Bev was disabled profoundly since birth, whereas you were able-bodied and then you had this shock accident and then woke up after a coma disabled. Yeah. How do you think that it's different to process, um, you know, for someone who's either been disabled all their lives and then for you going from being able-bodied to disabled, how, how was that to process? Um, interesting because, did I, I've never even considered it, I never even thought about it. Um, it was difficult to come to terms with the fact that I was never going to be the same again. Um, and even the smallest things like, I don't know. Uh, the fact that we, we talk about, we know that I've lost a leg, though, though I am, doesn't work. Even, even the smallest things are, are a pain when you have a disability. But the thought that I might not get out of that horizontal position, that I might, uh, my wife might become my carer for the rest of my life, that I might become a burden on my wife and my family, um, and that I'd be no use to society. Mm. I'm rubbish now, I'm no good. Let's chuck me out. That, those were all thoughts that, that I had. Um, I had many dark thoughts in, in the time. I've got to say, honestly, I, I never had any suicidal thoughts as, as part of my um, rebirth, I call it now. Um, but yes, you do have a, a degree of feeling useless. And am I washed up? That's it for me. And in fact, one of the, um, one of the strongest memories I've got is of in, during the time of the accident. Um, when I was laying on the floor, on the floor, I'd just been knocked off my bike. And I realized then that something was bad and something was wrong because um, I'm laying on my back and I can, oh, can't, all my leg hurts. And then my neck, oh, I can't move my arm, can't move my arm. Um, and I could smell the green grass. And it's a, it's a, a late September evening. And I knew I was going to be either very disabled or very dead. And I could see my wife looking over my grave and, um, you know, that's a moment where, very dark for me, and you realise and you think, well, and my thought was, well, you've had a good life, Neil. And you think about those, and I resigned myself to what was going to come. Um, and then no memory of that whatsoever until I came round. Um, and my wife, <laughs> we talked about dark moments earlier on, yeah, but my wife said to me, darling, you've been in an accident. And, um, and uh, yeah, you've been in a coma for a month. Wink if you recognise me, and I, because I, I was tubes here, tubes everywhere. And I blinked, and my son said to me, "Dad, it's our chum." Blink if you recognise me, and I went. He said, "Dad," and I went like that. I said, Who are you? <laughs> and the doctor asked, "Is, is that normal?" <laughs> yes, that is normal for me. Yeah, and and so the, obviously the character was still there, but by that stage I'd realised and maybe even accepted the fact that I I'd had a, a disability. Maybe I knew a lot more than that my conscious thought would let me uh, contemplate. So the accident was in September 2014. Yep. And you were in a coma, you say, for? For a month, coma for a month. For a yeah, month. Yeah, coma. So talk to me then about when you started to become more aware of what the implications were of the accident and how you adjusted to that. It's a huge life adjustment. Um, so the, the biggest adjustment I had, first of all, the, the weirdest thing was when you're on, you're on fentanyl and all the drugs that, that they can pump into you, um, I was subject to what I used to call a, a lot of alternate realities. And for anybody who's ever, I'm sure the people out there, there are some people that would have been in ICU 
they would have had accidents. But uh, you, you have alternate realities. I dreamt I was on living on a ship. I was dreamt I was um, I'd been recruited for black ops into Afghanistan to fly helicopters in Afghanistan. And I, you know, I'd gone for the flight test, but it was real to me because of this. So there was that whole period when you you come through that. Um, when there was a time I, I couldn't, I questioned the difference between reality and um, and, 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 and what, what was a dream. So it was only as I was coming off the drugs after after many, many months, I started to get the, the, the injection of, of reality of what it was all about. And the, the nice thing and the wonderful thing about the NHS is certainly the John Radcliffe Hospital and the Oxford Centre for Enablement over in, in Oxford, is they bring you back gently into, into the... Now they've saved your life. Um, and now they've got you back to a stable position. They've screwed you all back together, and it's the gentle realis realization that that when they're bringing you back to life, that things are going to be different. Um, you won't walk as, as well as somebody else. You you won't be able to you do things with one arm that that, that most people take for granted. Um, so I think it's an osmotic change, and you realize. But again, for me, going back to that, always optimistic. Yep, yeah, but I can't do that. But I will be able to do this. And I think what disabled people are wonderful at is adapting and overcoming. Um, most of us, have, we all went through a lockdown for a period of a couple of months. Disabled people know more about lockdowns than anybody else. You know, sometimes they're locked in the same house, the same room, in a wheelchair. They're locked down for life. So they have to become accustomed to that. And that happens osmotically. It does, it's, it's even though I had a, a life-changing accident, um, the acceptance doesn't come overnight. It's like, it's like um, uh, when you with your with the death in your family, isn't it? Is the acceptance is is the final step, and it's the same with the disability. Exactly the same. So, what advice would you give to anybody who, as you say, you know, it, it is it's it's dealing with that acceptance of a huge life change, whether it is a family bereavement or a disability from an accident. What advice would you give to anybody who is really struggling to overcome, firstly, the initial shock? and then living with the consequences of whatever this huge life change is for them? So I'd say time is a great healer. I'd say time brings acceptance. And then you'll realize that, okay, there's certainly there's a lot of things that you can't do in life, but there's a hell of a lot of things that you can do in life. Um, and those will always outweigh the negatives. Uh, I think a positive thought, a positive outlook, and a commitment if, if you want to make a change in your life, and it's not just about people with disabilities, everybody, if you're not happy with your life and, and you want to make a change, it's purely down to your control. It's up to you to make that change. I can't make that change for you. Um, and and it's, it's all about the spirit of motivation to come from that individual to say, you know, I can do that. Don't get down. There's no point in getting down. Pick yourself up, dust yourself down and get on with it. Um, and I'm sure that, especially when it comes from your own motivation, from your own, uh, from your own spirit and your own soul, it's a lot stronger than if someone else says, oh, you should try that, you should, you should try this. The forces of this great term, for any of our serving or ex-serving people who are watching, it's called being beasted, okay? So I remember being beasted over Dartmoor uh, with a colleague of mine called Graham, Mr. Stringer, and we'd be given a rock because we were late at, uh, at a checkpoint, and it was a big 20 kilo lump of granite. And uh, we put it in Graham's rucksack, and he fell over, he couldn't... couldn't <laughs> couldn't lift it put it in mind and someone said look the pain is a weakness leaving your body yeah that's that's a hackneyed old term which is rubbish quite frankly but nevertheless it's all in your mind it's all down to you all right I, ne I never quite understood that and i would say flip the then as i would have up until the accident yeah it's all in your mind it's all in your mind it's, but it's absolutely right your body will do exactly what you tell it to do what you want it to do so you are very much in control of your destiny for right or wrong for good or bad if you mess up in life that's your fault it's down to you nobody else as much as if you do something that's really what's something really good in life it's down to you and you're sort of somehow um regaining control of the situation or absolutely you're controlling i your have response. control absolutely i and i am a master of my own destiny especially if you've been through i mean typically with a disability you would have been through hospitals you'd have been with doctors uh, and, and there was a time in my life only a few years ago, where I'm laying in a hospital bed and every function of my body was being controlled by somebody else. And from a person who would be in control of his life all the way to that point, that was the most scary thing, realizing that you, you physically rely on those people in order to live, in order to survive. By taking back control of your own destiny yourself, 
that's empowering. That really is empowering. So what was the prognosis when you came round from coma? What were you told by doctors and nurses of what life you could expect afterwards? There was, there was lots of things that were said, but, but the reality of the matter was they, they didn't know at that stage. Um, how, I mean, I've, I'm still left with a one-inch hole in my skull from, from the accident. Uh, my arm is fused in, in one position. Obviously, I've got, I've got a left leg missing. And I've got about 30 screws in my left pelvis and a hip replacement. I've got plates here in this wrist here as well. And one of the screws is coming out, which is quite, quite interesting to feel it, actually. Um, but they didn't know. They didn't know whether I'd be sitting up. Because my hip and my pelvis was smashed so badly, they didn't know if I'd be able to support my own weight. They, the most ungainly and not very flattering device I was ever put in, like, you know, having a having baby yourself. If you remember those little baby supporters you'd hang off the, the door, the frame of the door, and they'd, they'd bounce on these little things, yeah? Well, they had an adult version of that. You know, bear in mind, I was 146 kilos at the time. I was a, I was a big unit. And it's, I've got a photo of myself somewhere. It's not the best photo of me. And I'm hanging from this. And they're trying to work out whether I can support my weight on my pelvis. Bearing in mind, it was all quite fresh then as well. Quite, quite painful in, in, in all areas. Um, they didn't know if I'd be able to sit up. They didn't know if I'd be able, to, be able to take my weight. They didn't know what effect the head injury would have, the break in my neck, the stability of my, of, of my head on my shoulders, literally. Um, and it was because of a fantastic NHS, but a wonderful wife, who was also a clinician, that I was able to take the baby steps back to, um, back to normality. So in terms of your recovery, how did you take control of that? And I imagine it was a very lengthy process. So how did you keep motivated throughout something so, so challenging? Um, well... <sighs> I guess the, the interesting answer to that is that let's just say we want to be an astronaut, okay? You want to be an astronaut. How do you get to that step? Well, you don't just walk, wake up one morning and and then suddenly you're an astronaut. An astronaut is is made, is built by baby steps, little steps. Um, and I I like the carrot and and the stick sort of reward myself. So I would wake up. To me, Weetabix is like crystal meth. I love the stuff. Weetabix is just, I would look at, I would say to myself, right, you're gonna get up and you're gonna have some Weetabix. And then you're going to do a little bit of exercise on, uh, I don't know, there, there was a point where I couldn't, I don't know if the camera could see it, but I couldn't even raise my leg to the to the side of my body, my, my new leg, my, my amputated leg. So it would come out and it would just flick like that, just by about an inch. And you do it day by day, bit by bit, and you get that strength back. So the initial motivation was the baby steps or I'm going to sit up. Uh, my wife would have, have what we should call my cheesy tea. And cheesy tea was, she would bribe me with the most rank smelling cheese, which I love, as long as I'd sit up for 15 minutes in the bed because I'd been used to laying back. So sitting up, would get, and then have my cheese, I'd be happy. So the little things, the little steps would give me the little motivations. And then it became, well, now I need to walk a mile, or now I need to swim a mile. And all these little steps built my fitness back uh, and my health back to a position where, you know, I, I'm kidding myself, I'm, I'm, I'm no athlete by any stretch of the imagination, but the whole thing about weight loss, fitness and physiotherapy was all about getting myself back to a healthy, stable platform for life. And physiotherapy, it's, I think it's a much misunderstood, uh, it's an art. And early physiotherapy made the biggest difference in in the long-term difference of my life so I've got some fond memories of darling physio terrorists I used to call them they'd bend me and stretch me and, but that was important it gave me the foundation to for, for a more healthy life if I hadn't have had those little goals and the supporting network which is just as important and the attitude I wouldn't you know I mean I've got a good life now and I'm happy with it so it's because of those those three things <laughs>